It's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. This video is for the Christians who keep saying Flat Earth is some kind of distraction to keep us from focusing on Jesus. This couldn't be further from the truth. Truly developing a relationship with Jesus and getting saved is the most important thing to me and should be with anyone proclaiming Christ as their Savior. But I have to ask, according to God, since when has the truth ever been a distraction, or even unimportant for that matter? Is the Flat Earth divisive? You bet it is, but the truth always is. Jesus specifically told his disciples he wasn't here to bring peace, but division. And if I'm not mistaken, he is also the truth, and the truth seems to do that. People have been saved or have developed a closer relationship and walk with God by the thousands due to discovering the truth about where we live. How do you think Jesus feels when some of you go on your channels Post in your comments that the Flat Earth is nonsense or stupid. Are all of those who have been saved due to realizing the Bible actually holds the truth no longer important? Do you realize when you post anti-Flat Earth videos and say you are a Christian that you actually run the risk of hurting someone else's walk for the Lord? We are all called to be fishers of men, and we should be on the same team, not trying to discredit one another's faith. The wide majority of the world is asleep to how Satan deceived the world, and he's been working on this deception in particular for thousands of years since the very beginning. Think about this for a minute. From the time we can talk, we're told we live on a globe in the vastness of space. Generation after generation, parents have unknowingly kept the lie going because they didn't know any different. We go through life and see nothing but globe all day, every day. Every TV show, every movie, on the news and in the newspaper, logos, emblems, textbooks, encyclopedias, teachers teach it, preachers preach it. We can't even look at the weather anymore without seeing the maps stuck to a giant water bottle. They make sure we believe that we have satellite TVs, use the latest GPS systems, and hear about every new planet they discovered on the news. That is, assuming we survived the daily asteroid that flew by. All the while, we sit and relax, watching the newest sci-fi movie, dreaming about visiting Mars and playing the latest alien video game over the wireless internet. The globe is pushed more than anything ever has been, and it's to the point now where if anyone even hears that you think differently, you get ridiculed and thought of as crazy, and you've been programmed to think like that, whether you realize it or not. People refuse to look into it because we have it in our mind that there's just no way that we could have been lied to. And anyone that doesn't just go along with the crowd must be stupid and should be treated as such. So why is it that when a self-proclaimed Christian is asked if they believe in the Big Bang, they'll say, no way. And then when you ask them how they feel about evolution, they say, oh, that's a lie from the pit of hell. But then when you ask them about living on a flat earth, you get, oh, heavens no, they wouldn't lie about that. They're scientists. Do you see the problem here? The Bible is the inspired word of God, and nothing should be added or taken away from it. Man should never twist God's word to fit his own worldview. And as a true Christian, it's crucial that you believe that. Either the Bible is the inspired word of God and 100% true, or it isn't. So knowing that, I've held my Bible up as a litmus test for this world many times before when it comes to things like evolution or the Big Bang or aliens. 
um, things like that. So I felt I had to hold the Bible up to the same standard when it came to our cosmology. In February of 2015, I began praying every day that the Lord would lead me into all truth, that he would give me knowledge and wisdom, the discernment to know what in this world was truth and what was deception. I had no idea what I was in for, and to be honest, the biblical cosmology is only scratching the surface. I highly suggest taking everything you hear from me or anyone else to the Lord. Throughout the Bible, every person God used to write any part of the inspired text we have today thought the earth was flat. Not one, including Jesus, thought we were living on a ball spinning at 1,038 miles per hour, flying around the sun at 66,600 miles per hour. There are literally hundreds of verses that I'll post a link to below that allude to God creating a flat, stationary earth with a dome firmament in which he has placed the sun, moon, and stars. We are told point blank that Satan deceives the whole world, but most Christians are under the impression that they aren't included in that because they've been saved. This isn't the case. We've all been deceived, guys, in one way or another. And if we're honest, Satan has been deceiving us since the garden. So if we as Christians realize we're being lied to when it comes to things like the origins of man with the Big Bang and evolution, why do so many of us still believe those very same scientists that say we came from monkeys when it comes to space and the earth? Satan is running this world for now, and the Bible clearly refers to him as the father of lies. Think about that for a minute. Does he just lie about everything else other than the creation of the vast infinite universe? Or is there a good possibility that he's lying about that too, and like the generations before us, we bought it? Repeatedly throughout the Bible, we see that something is established when we have two or three witnesses to back it up. So how many Old Testament prophets and disciples did the Lord use to write the Bible? I definitely think we have plenty of witnesses. So let's start at the beginning. God created the sun, moon, and stars on the fourth day. However, grass, fruit, trees, and all other vegetation were created on day three. That doesn't fit the globe model that we are taught. We could literally have made a side salad on the earth on day three, but the entire infinite universe, including all other galaxies full of stars and planets, was created on day four. It should make you wonder, was the earth spinning on the first three days? If we were not spinning, the force countering the spin, gravity, would crush us. So when did God make gravity? What were we orbiting before he made the sun? In fact, when did the Bible mention God spinning the earth faster than the speed of sound and launching it around the sun in the first place? I think you'll find there are a lot of things we're adding to his creation in order to fit what we've been told. And unfortunately, pride is standing in the way of most. The Bible goes on to mention God creating two great lights, the greater to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, which I believe means exactly what it says, two great lights, meaning the moon is giving its own light. Man tells us the moon is a giant rock with magical reflecting properties that reflects the first great light. We are told the sun, moon, and stars are for signs and seasons and to give light on the earth. That means the stars were created to light the earth. Like it says, it also means they weren't considered great lights. Man tells us stars are enormous, a lot of which are much larger than our own sun and millions of times larger than the earth, all light years away with solar systems of their own. Does it make sense that God created a vast universe, including all stars and planets and galaxies on day four, but spent the rest of creation week focusing on the earth, making plants and animals and people? The truth is, stars are much smaller and much closer than modern-day monkey man science would have us believe. And they've been placed above our head as God's giant celestial clock. So when we look up, we know what time it is. There are several places in the Bible, actually, that tell us one day that stars will fall to the earth. In fact, Jesus himself tells us this. That should be a big red flag for globe cosmology if you're a Bible believer, because it really paints us into a corner. And we only have so many options we can believe. Either A, Jesus did not know what the stars were, which I don't believe because he's God and most definitely knows what the stars are. Or B, Jesus knew what the stars were. He even said the Hebrew word that meant stars, but really he meant asteroids, comets, meteors. I don't believe that either because Jesus himself is the truth and wouldn't lie to his disciples or deceive them in any way by saying one thing but really meaning something else. Or there's C. Jesus knew exactly what the stars were, 
meant that near the end of days, the stars would literally begin to fall out of their place in the firmament to the earth below. Here again, if we listen to man, it would be like trillions of flaming beach balls hitting a single grain of sand. There's a reason we're told the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God, you know. I'm just saying. In Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 through 14, and in Isaiah 38, verses 7 and 8, we see something really interesting. The Lord stops the sun from going down a full day in Joshua and makes the sundial go backwards 10 degrees in Isaiah. Both of these instances would mean the globe Earth stopped its rotation completely and in Isaiah's case, rotated backwards in order for the sun to do that in the sky. The truth is, Earth is flat and stationary. The much smaller, closer sun circling overhead stopped, and in Isaiah's case, went backwards. There are a lot of instances in the Bible that we have not clearly understood because we've been indoctrinated with the wrong model. How about the Tower of Babel? If the world was a spinning globe, why didn't God just let them build it? Think about it. They couldn't have survived outer space. Why was Nimrod even trying to build it for that matter? Wouldn't the enemy at least know it was a globe? Wouldn't the tower eventually have been destroyed when reaching the point where the thousand mile per hour atmosphere that's spinning along with the Earth meets that non-rotating vacuum of space? And if I'm not mistaken, aren't we told the temperatures up there are pretty inhospitable? It just seems to me like if things are the way we're told in science class, the problem would have solved itself. But instead, God had to intervene. I am interested in hearing the globe theories in the Tower of Babel, so feel free to leave them in the comments. The Earth must have been swinging that thing around like a bat. The truth is, they were trying to reach the firmament, and God knew what they were trying to do, and he stopped them. I feel like I could go on and on, because once you realize the truth, you'll read the entire Bible with new eyes. My entire YouTube channel is dedicated to two things. One is to show my brothers and sisters the truth about our Father's creation, and the other is for the atheists that believe there is no creator to finally realize there has to be one and eventually come to know Jesus. And praise God, many atheists have been saved due to finding out the truth. And even though the flat earth is unconventional, God can use anything to bring lost sheep into the fold, and he will. If you really look into it, you will see what Satan has done and what our Father is revealing to us here in the end times. One last thing to think about. If we were on a flat stationary earth with a dome firmament in which God has placed the sun, moon, and stars, wouldn't it be Satan's goal to create a deception that literally hides the creator from us? Think about it. Evolution, the Big Bang, atheism, an infinite, ever-expanding universe where man is unimportant, and everything happens by chance. The make-believe asteroids and solar waves that will disguise the judgments of God so man doesn't repent. Not to mention the alien card, which will be used to usher in the Antichrist, explain away missing people, and have all the world's armies gathered together at the very end to defend the earth from Jesus. All of those are due to this one lie. It becomes very apparent once you see the truth that the globe space lie is the base deception on which all of Satan's other deceptions stem. There is plenty of evidence out there other than the Bible to show you the truth. For example, hundreds of curvature tests have been done by many of us, and not one shows we live on a globe. The curvature simply isn't there. So regardless of how you feel or what stance on our cosmology you take, there is one thing that is inevitable. There will come a day when we will stand before the Lord and answer for every word that has come out of our mouth. If I'm wrong, I'm fully prepared to stand before God and be wrong for believing in his word and telling others what I felt was the truth, regardless of how I was looked at or treated. Are you prepared to stand before the Lord if you're wrong for sticking up for the wisdom of this world, where we actually need to twist his scriptures to fit what atheist scientists tell us happened millions of years ago? Or better yet, are you ready to explain why you discourage those who are new to the faith because you trusted man over your Bible? It takes a humble heart to find the truth. Pride truly is the greatest sin of all, and it will keep many from even looking. The decision is yours. God bless, guys.
Newton was not the first of the Age of Reason. He was the last of the magicians, the last of the Babylonians and Sumerians, the last great mind that looked out on the visible and intellectual world with the same eyes as those who began to build our intellectual inheritance rather less than ten thousand years ago. Sir Isaac Newton is one of the most influential scientists in history. He made substantial contributions to physics, mathematics, and astronomy, most notably his laws of motion, universal gravitation, and the development of calculus. However, Newton's interests extended far beyond these realms, and his work in alchemy remains a fascinating and somewhat mysterious aspect of his life. Let's explore his journey into the allegorical world of alchemy together. Isaac Newton's foray into the realm of the occult can be primarily traced back to his deep-seated fascination with alchemy. As a young man, Newton's innate curiosity about natural sciences and material science would eventually pave the way for some of his most renowned contributions to the scientific world. His initial exposure to alchemical theories and practices occurred during his formative years when a twelve-year-old Newton resided in the attic of an apothecary's shop. During that time, the Rosicrucian movement had caused a great deal of excitement within Europe's scholarly community. When you consider Newton's connection to members affiliated with various secret societies, it becomes obvious that his interest in alchemy and philosophy might have been influenced by this particular group. We'll dive into this later in the video. In this still mystic and superstitious era, the field of chemistry was still in its nascent stages. Consequently, many of his experimental endeavors employed esoteric language and ambiguous terminology, characteristics commonly linked to alchemy and occultism. It was only several decades after Newton's passing that Antoine Lavoisier's pioneering work in Stoic Iometry led to the development of analytical chemistry, with its distinct nomenclature that closely mirrors contemporary chemistry. It is worth noting that Newton's contemporary and fellow Royal Society member Robert Boyle had already unearthed the fundamental concepts of modern chemistry. Boyle was instrumental in laying the groundwork for modern experimental practices and communication standards within the realm of chemistry. However, Newton did not incorporate this information into his own work. Newton's writings indicate that one of his primary objectives in pursuing alchemy may have been to uncover the philosopher's stone, a mythical substance believed to transform base metals into gold. To a lesser degree, he may have also sought the elusive elixir of life. Newton seemingly held the conviction that metals harbored a semblance of life, as evidenced by his belief in Diana's tree, an alchemical demonstration in which a dendritic growth of silver emerges from a solution. During Newton's time, certain alchemical practices were outlawed in England, partly due to fraudulent practitioners who deceived wealthy patrons with unrealistic promises. As a result, the English crown, concerned about the potential devaluation of gold resulting from counterfeit production, imposed harsh penalties for illicit alchemy. In extreme cases, offenders faced public hanging on a gilded scaffold, adorned with tinsel and other decorative elements. Owing to the heretical ideas associated with alchemy and its connection to counterfeiting knowledge, Newton needed to exercise discretion in his alchemical pursuits. At the time, mobs were known to target heretics, and alchemy was deemed perilous. Unfortunately, a significant portion of Newton's alchemical writings may have been lost in a laboratory fire, leaving the true scope of his contributions in this domain largely unknown. But, from what we know, Newton's beliefs extended to the notion that metals could vegetate, and that the entire cosmos or matter was alive and connected to the world soul, or anima mundi as alchemists called it. He also speculated that gravity resulted from the emission of an alchemical principle he referred to as salnita. A significant portion of Newton's research into the motion of celestial bodies was guided by his belief in a single, invisible force responsible for the orbital patterns of these entities, a belief we often encounter in Hermeticism. Newton envisioned this unseen force as universal, unchanging, and capable of being described and predicted through the language of mathematics and natural law, rather than being associated with the occult. Contrarily, other natural philosophers, such as Descartes, opposed this idea, 
and maintained that action relied on physical contact. They suggested that the motion of celestial objects resulted from numerous small particles moving them through space, but where did Newton take inspiration from in his resolute and mixed spiritual beliefs? As we can see, he studied both aspects of matter, spiritual and physical, as opposed to many scholars who were either scientific materialists or pure mystics. Throughout his life, Newton studied a wide range of alchemical texts, including the works of Geber, Paracelsus, and Michael Sendivogius. These texts provided him with a wealth of knowledge and inspiration that informed his own experiments and theories. Among the most notable documents in Newton's collection are those titled Artifius His Secret Book and the Epistle of Ion Pontanus. These documents comprise a compilation of excerpts from another work called Nicholas Flamel, his exposition of the hieroglyphical figures, which he commissioned to be painted on an arch in St. Innocent's Churchyard in Paris. Alongside the Secret Book of Artifius and the Epistle of Ion Pontanus, this work encompasses both the theoretical and practical aspects of the philosopher's stone. Newton may have also referred to the Latin version of this text found within Lazarus Zetzner's Theatrum Chemicum, a volume frequently linked to the Turba Philosophorum and other early European alchemical manuscripts. Nicolas Flamel, one of the subjects in the aforementioned work, was an enigmatic figure often associated with the discovery of the philosopher's stone hieroglyphical figures, early forms of tarot, and occultism. Artifius and his secret book also piqued the interest of 17th-century alchemists. In the 1936 auction of Newton's collection was The Epitome of the Treasure of Health, written by Edwardus Generosus Anglicus Innominate, who lived in 1562 AD. This 28-page treatise delves into the philosopher's stone, the animal or angelical stone, the prospective stone, also known as the magical stone of Moses, and the vegetable or growing stone. Newton's various surviving alchemical notebooks clearly show that he made no distinctions between alchemy and what we today consider science. On the very same pages in which we find the recordings of his legendary optics experiments, we also find various recipes culled from arcane sources. William R. Newman a scholar of the history of science who has collected many of Newton's alchemical manuscripts writes, Alongside sober explanations of optical and physical phenomena, such as freezing and boiling, we find Neptune's trident, Mercury's caducean rod, and the green lion, all symbolizing alchemical substances. There are also clear connections between Newton's alchemical pursuits and his work in physics and mathematics. His alchemical understanding of matter and forces informed his development of the laws of motion and universal gravitation. Additionally, his alchemical experiments may have inspired the development of calculus, as he sought mathematical tools to model and analyze the complex transformations he observed in the laboratory. The relationship between Newton's alchemical studies and his scientific achievements has been a subject of debate among scholars. Some argue, that his alchemical pursuits were a distraction from his more legitimate scientific work, while others maintain that these interests were essential to his overall intellectual development and contributed significantly to his groundbreaking discoveries. Due to the threat of punishment and the potential scrutiny he feared from his peers within the scientific community, Newton may have deliberately left his work on alchemical subjects unpublished, Newton was well known for being highly sensitive to criticism, such as the numerous instances when he was criticized by Robert Hooke, and his admitted reluctance to publish any substantial information regarding calculus before 1693. A perfectionist by nature, Newton also refrained from the publication of material that he felt was incomplete, as evident from a 38-year gap between Newton's conception of calculus in 1666 and its final full publication in 1704, which would ultimately lead to the infamous Leibniz-Newton calculus controversy. Newton's Biblical Studies Sir Isaac Newton devoted significant time and effort to the study of the Temple of Solomon, dedicating an entire chapter of his work, The Chronology of Ancient Kingdoms Amended, 
to his findings on this magnificent structure. To gather information about the temple, Newton primarily relied on the Book of Kings, translating the descriptions from Hebrew to English using dictionaries, as his knowledge of the Hebrew language was limited. Besides scripture, Newton turned to a variety of ancient and contemporary sources to enrich his understanding of the temple. He held the belief that many ancient sources possessed sacred wisdom, and that the proportions and design of their temples held intrinsic spiritual significance. This conviction led Newton to explore architectural masterpieces from Hellenistic Greece and Roman sources such as Vitruvius in pursuit of their hidden occult knowledge. This concept, often referred to as Prisca Sapientia or sacred wisdom, as well as the ancient wisdom revealed to Adam and Moses directly by God, was widely accepted among scholars of Newton's time. As a Bible scholar, Newton initially focused on the sacred geometry of Solomon's temple, including golden sections, conic sections, spirals, orthographic projection, and other harmonious constructions. However, he also believed that the dimensions and proportions of the temple held a deeper meaning. He posited that the measurements provided in the Bible were mathematical puzzles waiting to be solved. To Newton, the temple's design was a result of King Solomon's enlightened vision and divine guidance. The geometry of the temple, in Newton's eyes, symbolized more than just a mathematical blueprint. It also offered a chronological framework for Hebrew history. This perspective prompted him to incorporate a chapter on the temple in the chronology of ancient kingdoms amended, even though it may initially appear unrelated to the book's overarching historical focus. Newton was convinced that the writings of ancient philosophers, scholars, and biblical figures concealed sacred wisdom, and that their architecture held similar secrets. He theorized that these individuals had embedded their knowledge within a complex code of symbolic and mathematical language, which, when decoded, would unveil a deeper understanding of the natural world. Furthermore, Newton dedicated a significant portion of his life to the pursuit and revelation of what could be regarded as a Bible code. He placed particular emphasis on interpreting the Book of Revelation, producing extensive writings and several manuscripts that detailed his insights and interpretation. Newton's Connections to Secret Societies Throughout history, Sir Isaac Newton has been intriguingly linked to various secret societies and fraternal orders. Given the clandestine nature of these organizations, coupled with the scarcity of publicly available evidence and questionable motives for attributing Newton's involvement, it remains a challenge to definitively confirm his membership in any specific group. Nevertheless, it is worth noting that several Masonic buildings have been dedicated in his honor. Despite the uncertainty surrounding his membership status, Newton was known to be associated with numerous individuals who themselves were often labeled as members of esoteric groups. It remains unclear whether these connections were due to Newton's widely recognized scholarly achievements. His role as an early member and president of the Royal Society, his prominent position as master of the mint, his status as a knight, or his active pursuit of membership in these secretive organizations. Considering the nature and legality of alchemical practices during his lifetime, as well as his possession of various alchemical materials and manuscripts, it is plausible that Newton was part of a group of like-minded thinkers and collaborators. However, the degree of organization, secrecy, and Newton's involvement within such a group remains a mystery. Although Newton was generally considered a private individual with limited social inclinations, Joining societies or clubs was a popular form of interpersonal networking during his time. Given his esteemed social status, it is likely that Newton would have had some interactions with such groups at different levels. He was undoubtedly a member of the Royal Society of London for the Improvement of Natural Knowledge and the Spalding Gentleman's Society, but these were scholarly societies rather than esoteric ones. Newton's membership in any particular secret society remains elusive and speculative, yet it continues to fuel popular fascination, except for one. And just like touching a raw exposed nerve, the flat-earth controversy cuts deep at this idolatry. 
and pokes it right at its most sensitive point. And this is how I see this last day's realization, this end times rediscovery, as being a true gift from above, even if most of the church is too stubborn to accept it. Because truly, if you are too afraid to even honestly investigate something right now, even while the world teaches that it's sheer idiocy, that it's absolutely insane and something to be ridiculed and scorned, then how on earth do you seriously think you are going to fare when it finally does come time to make the decision to effectively walk away from every luxury of the civilized modern world in order to refuse to take the mark of the beast? What good will all your research about transhumanism and microchips and genetic hybrids and everything else be if you can't even handle being ridiculed for believing the Bible over the opinions of men. Because when those days finally do come, do you not realize that being mocked or looking stupid in the eyes of the world will be the very least of what you will have to endure in order to not compromise your very soul? Do you not think it will be regarded as the utmost insanity to even consider opting out of the Antichrist's promises of a technological utopia? Do you not think that you will have to resist to the pleas of your own family members to just be sensible and do what you need to do to survive? Do you not know that you will face scorn of entire church congregations and pastors who will have chosen to join the system rather than close their doors? Do you not realize that you will have to live by faith in a way that you and I have never really had to do for our entire comfortable modern lives? relying on God alone to provide our basic needs, not knowing where the next meal might come from, not being able to get a paying job, not being able to buy or sell. Newton and the Rosicrucian Arguably, the movement that had the most significant influence on Isaac Newton was Rosicrucianism. Although the Rosicrucian movement had stirred excitement within Europe's intellectual circles during the early 17th century, its prominence had somewhat waned by the time Newton reached adulthood. Nevertheless, the movement profoundly impacted Newton's alchemical work and philosophical thought. The Rosicrucian conviction of being specially chosen for the ability to communicate with angels or spirits resonates with Newton's prophetic beliefs. Moreover, the Rosicrucians claimed to possess the elixir of life and the philosopher's stone, which would grant them eternal life and the power to create infinite wealth. Like Newton, the Rosicrucians were deeply religious, avowedly Christian, anti-Catholic, and highly politicized. Newton took a keen interest in their alchemical pursuits, as well as their belief in esoteric truths of ancient history and the notion of enlightened individuals gaining insight into nature the physical universe, and the spiritual realm. At the time of his death, Newton's personal library contained 169 books on alchemy, and it is believed that he owned even more during his Cambridge years, though he may have sold them before moving to London in 1696. His collection was considered one of the finest alchemical libraries of his time. Among the volumes Newton left behind were heavily annotated personal copies of key Rosicrucian texts, including The Fame and Confession of the Fraternity R.C. by Thomas Vaughan, and works by the learned alchemist Michael Meyer. Newton's possession of these materials does not, however, confirm his membership in any early Rosicrucian order. Some argue that his personal alchemical investigations focused on discovering materials the Rosicrucians claimed to have long before his birth, would exclude him from their ranks. Yet, in religious terms, one person's discovery would not preclude others from seeking the same truth. During his lifetime, Newton and several members of the Royal Society were openly accused of being Rosicrucians. Although it remains uncertain whether Isaac Newton was indeed a Rosicrucian, and he never publicly identified as one, his writings suggest that he may have shared many of their sentiments and beliefs. The enigmatic connections between Newton and various secret societies continue to captivate the imaginations of scholars and enthusiasts alike. 
While his membership in esoteric organizations remains largely speculative, these associations add another layer of intrigue to the already fascinating life of one of history's most brilliant minds. Sir Isaac Newton's profound impact on science, mathematics, and philosophy is undisputed, but the possibility that he was part of a secret world of knowledge seekers only adds to the allure of his extraordinary legacy. Conclusion Although he employed theories of alchemical origin as a means of understanding and enlarging natural philosophy, the countless hours he spent deciphering alchemical texts and putting his conclusions to the test in his laboratory had a more practical goal. In a word, the founder of classical physics aimed his bolt at the marvellous menstrua and volatile spirits of the sages, the instruments required for making the philosopher's stone. Difficult as it may be for moderns to accept that the most influential physicist before Einstein dreamed of becoming an alchemical adept, the gargantuan labor that Newton devoted to experimental chrysopoeia speaks for itself. The chemical tools envisaged by Newton, had he been able to acquire them, would have handed him the power to alter nature to its very heart. These were the secrets that the true hermetic philosopher must keep hidden lest they cause immense damage to ye world, as he said to the secretary of the Royal Society in 1676. The core of Newton's labors at deciphering the documents of the adepts lay in his own undying quest to join their number, and for this reason many consider Newton the first of the Age of Reason and the last of the magicians. In light of all that's transpired in the past year, just in the the flat earth movement and in the world at large and in many ways the the point of that video was like it was more or less directed at other christians other believers who continue to scoff at flat earth and refuse to investigate enclosed cosmology and all this and because they're clinging to mainstream assumptions mainstream assertions about science and the cosmos and history and all sorts of things you know just basically the whole idea of a, a being too afraid to touch flat earth because you don't want to look crazy but how s such a thing by coming into flat earth and just embracing the quote-unquote craziest thing you could possibly research there's a blessing in that because that should serve to help prepare us for the ridicule and the persecution that is coming on an even greater level that far outweighs just being mocked here on social media or in your families and churches and such for believing in a flat earth but the irony is is that now as i listen to myself from a year ago and just think about all the the drama that's been going on just recently in the last week and over the past several months and just back and forth and, and i think it just kind of helps me step back and realize what a lot of my frustration has been about you know, really, when you when you get down to it, is that so much of what has transpired and, and congealed into this trying to cobble together some official flat Earth movement, some official flat Earth alliance in terms of conferences and businesses and ministries and conflating all these things into this big confusing mess, where ecumenical compromise just continues to gradually balloon and be dismissed and and swept under the rug, excused away for the sake of the Flat Earth movement, and, and then defending these actions, the commercialization, the profiteering, by actually hiding behind the genuine conversions, the genuine testimonies that are out there in the thousands of people coming to God and coming to Christ because of Flat Earth, but using that as a justification to essentially try and build various m little media empires based around flat earth and biblical cosmology and all these things. And the rationales that I'm hearing just continue to get more convoluted and contradictory and wackier all the time. It's been hijacked. Satan understood that, you know, he can have all these opposing belief systems, you know, whether it's Buddhism or New Age or Satanism or whatever. And everyone can, can detect and understand that, you know, if I'm a Satanist, I'm in another religion than Christianity or I'm in another. But. What if all of a sudden you could masquerade your agenda in something that was disguised, you know, 
and it wasn't presented as religion. It was presented as fact, reality. There's no debate. So to me, this is so critically important because he's been able to get away with so much of his agenda. And again, Scientific Exposed 2 explains all that, but also shows to, you know, well, why, number one, but also two, where is this heading us? Is he just lying to us because he's the father of all lies? Or is he preparing us? Is he preparing the world for the great deception? Does he have a plan? And does it make sense that he would need evolution? He would need the Big Bang. He would need a spinning ball flying through space. You need that to have evolution. You need that to de completely destroy a creator. Think about it. If you are on an enclosed world, if you're on a world that is positioned at the center and everything revolves around it, there's the creator. Everyone in this community, whether they're Christian or not, I mean, I can I can go through the list, you know, uh, Globusters, I could go through like Jaron or Bob or Mark Sargent or any of these, whether or not they're completely following the word of God and understanding the true creator of creation, they still say they're hiding God, they're hiding a creator. So in a split second, I've seen people go from atheists to believers in the sense that they're like, there's a creator. But one step further, I'm significant. I must be unique. Remember before we were dealing with the situation, we'd run into people and they'd be like, oh, I believe in a higher power. And you'd be like, okay, what's your higher power's name? Uh, what's your higher power like? Uh, what does your higher power like and dislike? They have no clue. They're just like, I believe in a higher power, you know? But here we're dealing with something where there's also some significance and dignity brought to the table where even people can recognize it going, whoa, wow, there was a lot of care put into this that everything would be created for us. So to me, this is such an incredible topic. I'm so passionate about it. I love speaking about it. I'm just so humbled that God is using me. Who am I? I mean, I'm not very smart. I'm not very talented. And yet God is using me to, you know, bring this topic and, you know, people's lives are changing. So it's just an absolute joyous um, experience for me in the last three years doing this. And I'm excited for what's coming next. Uh, just, just to comment on uh, one thing that you had said about everyone discovers how important they are once they discover this truth. And, and the part that amazes me about it the most is that whether you're Christian or no, we are all made to be the center of God's universe. I mean, figur uh, figuratively and, and physically, we are literally the center of the universe. That puts a massive importance on all of us. And that completely destroys the we are a speck on a speck rotating around a speck. And that completely destroys that that whole ideology that we're nothing and, and that we're insignificant. And I think that's the part that really grabs people when they grab onto this revelation. So, yeah. so yeah, I totally agree with you there. Yeah, and again, the deception is so, I mean, people that have studied Gnosticism, and again, for the record, because uh, I know in the chat some people are saying that I support New Agers. No, I don't. What I'm saying is it's incredible that basically people that are affected by this scientific worldview that are waking up to the truth instantly come to recognize that there must be a creator different than just a force or a big spiritual, you know, there's a big spiritual soup going on, uh, you know, with all the religions in the world. But this one centers it in. And what I'm saying is I think that that uh, Yahweh, the true creator. And this is the interesting thing. When it comes to Gnosticism, you have Lucifer, you know, he's the light bearer. He's the illuminator. And he's always about basically saying, you know, Yahweh, you know, he was trying to give you rules. He was trying to restrict you. And I, I'm going to set you free. And it's interesting how the world twisted and looks at, you know, freedom and all these things as good. Well, God was protecting us. And what I find in Gnosticism, and this is where it gets deep into the whole flat earth topic, is Gnosticism teach that he's the liberator. So follow me on this, because I was praying about this the other day, and it really came to me. And this really blows this whole thing open. It's just like Lucifer to say, Yahweh, you know. He basically is telling you that he basically enclosed you, but I set you free. I put you on a ball flying. You can go wherever you are. You can ascend the stars. You know, don't be in that enclosed system. What I'm saying is he goes against anything that's protective, that's good for us, and gives us an opposing worldview and a, an ideology of something of freedom. And there's nothing more free than flying around the heavens on a ball, <laughs> you know,
people are waking up. So what I say is this is a great vehicle. As a Christian, if you're Christian, you care about your loved ones and your friends, you know, tools like Scientism Exposed are awesome. But this topic is amazing. I've never seen a greater witnessing opportunity to tell people about the true creator of creation than this one topic. I have never seen more people when they wake up to the lies of NASA and scientism, when it comes to the shape of the earth, when it comes to everything with our cosmology, running to the Bible. Everyone, talk to anyone that's come to flat earth. At one point, they went out and bought a King James Bible, or at one point, they started studying, you know, all these scriptures, you know, and whether they believe in the Bible or not, they're like, I believe in those verses because that follows my senses and it follows my eyes. So again, I tell people, I say, it's not our job to change people. God will change people through his word. Beautiful thing is God's waking people up all over and they're coming to the Bible. They're listening to channels such as ours because they're interested in this topic. And one by one, it's not our words that we speak. It's his words that speak, that penetrate the heart. And that's what's the amazing thing. When we're following his lead, we're allowing him, obviously, just the Holy Spirit to convict people's lives through this topic, I have never seen anything greater. And I've always been passionate about evangelism, sharing the gospel. You know, I've been involved with all these sort of things, talking to over thousands of people. I was involved in prison ministry, street ministry. I've been involved in many things. I've always had such a desire and passion for sharing the truth of Jesus. But I've never seen a topic that basically wakes people up so much to saying, if this was a lie and I was deceived my whole life, I want to know the truth. And this is starting to show me the truth. And they run to it, you know, before they go wrong. He can't change reality, but he can convince people with the lie. But all of a sudden, revealing the lies when it came to evolution. For a while, you know, at the beginning, if you follow uh, time, you'll see that a lot of people were ridiculing the whole evolution. But a lot of creation ministries did some amazing work exposing evolution with the church and with Christians. So it's like almost like we're in the next phase. And what I find interesting about this phase is I have never, ever, been on one side fighting the war against Satan or scientism and had so many people backing me that don't even believe in the Bible. To me, it amazes me that I've got all this help now breaking down, you know, Dawkins and evolution and Big Bang cosmology. We've never had anyone on our side. It's always been, you know, the creation creationists versus evolutionists. Now we've got miles of people that are doing their own work and people say, yeah, but this guy is saying this and, and that's deception. But you have to understand that for me, I mean, when I first came to this topic, I looked at Eric Dubé. I looked at other people. It didn't mean I stayed there and I followed their spirituality. And I mean, Eric Dubé basically goes so far as he doesn't even believe that Jesus, the Messiah even existed. But that's not to discredit the fact that got some knowledge from that and then moved on in their path. So I say, don't be so worried about, you know, what people are doing. God's doing a huge work in this. He's waking up people, and they don't even know. And ultimately what I hear is just that there is nothing but lip service for resisting the underlying threat of the, the New Age gospel uh, by continuing to partner with people who reject the Bible, continuing to, to partner with people and give a stage, give a podium to people who reject the Bible, reject the cross, Embrace, want to embrace a creator, want to embrace being special, but in the name of flat earth and flat earth unity and God working through flat earth and everyone's on this, everyone's on their journey, everyone's, you know, we can't change men's hearts, so God's working everything. Oblivious to the fact that <laughs> Satan absolutely can and is using enclosed cosmology to push new age mysticism, new age occultism to thousands of people as well. And so while we talk about revival, and we see genuine conversion and genuine repentance and genuine faith coming as a result, genuine fruit, the enemy is at work too. And for every Christian flat earth message, I, you know, I see at least 10 that are, that are of the enemy twisting it one way or another. And there's so many different ways that it can be twisted, so many different false teachings that are coming in, whether it's Gnosticism that's in the name of Christianity, and, and Robbie just simply refuses to stand up and disassociate himself from the Gnostic heresies of Zen Garcia and hail him as a brother, hail him as a Christian flat earther, when he's pointing people to every occult text under the sun, preaching serpent seed doctrine, preaching all these other doctrines of demons, and actually trying to defend the idea that you're not promoting New Agers and atheists. And isn't it great that we're we're all working together to fight Satan. We're all working together to fight evolution and Darwinism and the idea of being an accident. But oh, you're special. 
New Agers believe that they're special. The fact that people believe in a creator and believe that they're special in and of itself does not mean that they're actually automatically closer to the gospel. If you understand the New Age gospel, it's all about embracing the idea that you're special. So much so to the to the point of embracing the fact that you are God, that God is in you, that we're all a part of God. It's pantheism. It's all about being quote unquote special. But I want to cut it down so that the bottom line lie you're familiar with and that you'll recognize, and I'll give you some examples. And that lie is that God is in everyone and everything. Uh, I'll give you an example. In the book, The Shack by William Paul Young, garnered the attention of a lot of Christians. It was a best-selling book. His Jesus in that book said, God who is the ground of all being dwells in and around and through all things. The word creation in that book is spelled with a capital C over 20 times. I recognize that from my New Age days because when God is in his creation, you spell creation with a capital C. Putting words, if that isn't a sign of the times, putting words that are heretical in Jesus' mouth. The Jesus of Jesus calling. Right now, as I stand here, the best-selling, number one Christian book, over 12 million copies. Spin-off products. You go to your local Christian bookstore, instead of the prophecy section, you'll see the Sarah Young section. She's the author of this book. She reputedly received messages from Jesus Christ, wrote them down, put them in the form of a devotional that has just captured so many, not just women, but so many people's attention. I have a book back there called Another Jesus Calling, basically the dangers of contemplative prayer, showing how the Jesus and Jesus calling is not the real Jesus. Well, wait a second, you might say, there's scripture throughout that book. Well, there's also a lot of things that aren't true, and you don't find that in the Bible. You know, it's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Dr. Harry Ironside, uh, who was the pastor for many years at Moody Memorial Bible Church right here in Chicago, wrote an article that I would recommend downloading and just putting with your materials. It's called Exposing Error, Is It Worthwhile? I'll just read several paragraphs from that. He said, Objection is often raised, even by some sound in the faith, regarding the exposure of error as being entirely negative and of no real edification. Of late, the hue and cry has been against any and all negative teaching, but the brethren who assume this attitude forget that a large part of the New Testament, both of the teaching of our blessed Lord himself and the writings of the apostles, is made up of this very character of ministry, namely, showing the satanic origin and therefore the unsettling results of the propagation of erroneous systems, which Peter, in his second epistle, so definitely refers to as damnable heresies. God in everyone and everything is a damnable heresy. And the crazy thing is, is that, you know, a lot of people get upset by, by this whole debate and upset by these kinds of, you know, division. You're causing division. But the reality is, has been, I think, further, further highlighted by various developments that come out just, just this past week when we look at China. Look at what they just rolled out there. The whole implementation of social social ratings, your social score, determining whether you're allowed to travel, you know, on planes or on trains or everybody being tracked in social media and all this stuff. And I suppose it's easy for some people to look and, and say, oh, well, that's that's China, that's communist China. But if you understand that that's, that's where everything is going, you know, and all we have all these different countries that are under the same control. I mean, if you think China is somehow separate from the, the Western Illuminati-controlled nation-states, then I think you're flat earthers, you should understand, right? I mean, we know that China is China's faking space, just like the United States, just like Europe, just like Russia. we got Chinese space bubbles, too. So where do you think this is all going? Right now we're seeing the whole, you know, the YouTube purge and this whole idea about they're going to start actually, like, Tag like inserting Wikipedia articles on top of quote unquote conspiracy theory videos. I mean, this is just the beginning. The censorship is happening. 
the, the purging of the internet is happening. All these things that we now so take for granted and sort of have come to convince ourselves that are, that are, are rights. They, they're not rights. They're, they're given to us free. Why Google and YouTube and using the internet period more and more. So these are going to be privileges, privileges that are revoked from those who are deemed to be speaking things and saying things that are considered unacceptable. I mean, the frog is still swimming around in the pot, but the heat's getting turned up slowly, you know, bit by bit, until it boils. But we're not there yet, right? So we just keep on trucking along, we keep on making our plans, we keep on trying to expand, writing books, planning conferences. You know, what's next? How far are Christians who are waking up to the flat earth realization, waking up to just how big and massive the deception is, but then continue to, to entertain these ideas of then embracing the world <laughs> and embracing all these mechanisms of the world, whether it's technology or whether it's just media and marketing or whether it's whatever, continuing to treat the church like a business, continuing to, to treat the gospel and treat the truth like a product that can be bought and sold, continuing to regard ministry as something that's some kind of entrepreneurial exercise, when we are rapidly <laughs> approaching a time in history where those things will just become obsolete, we won't be having these debates at some point in the future because we won't be on the Internet. Mm. Or at least I know I won't be. Mm. I won't be allowed on the Internet, period. Yet we want to keep expanding and networking, having more, more and more conferences, getting bigger venues, having bigger budgets, having bigger and better production values. Now, now we're all getting excited about making a, a TV show or a movie or whatever a seed is now being imagined. I mean, I'll just, I might as well go ahead and just hit this one too. The irony, right? irony of having whatever percentage of the flat earth Christian community is wrapped up in all the, you know, with all this Hebrew roots, Ephraim awakening, whatever you want to call it, and people coming to understand the pagan roots of things like Christmas and Easter and wanting nothing to do with that and wanting to, to come out of that. And, and there's a lot of legitimate motivations at, at the outset, at the intro to that. But the whole, the whole point is that there's a thousand different Christmases and Easter's out there. It's, it's, holidays is just, it's like the most superficial level of that. So, so to, to, to be excited about, like, you don't celebrate Christmas or Easter and you're getting back into the, the Jewish festivals and all that, but then embracing Hollywood and the idea of making movies and using special effects and trying to use science fiction and, and you know... The, Getting into Flat Earth has only made me realize just how how extensively science fiction has just been a tool of the enemy. And this whole argument of, well, we're going to take it and we're going to use it to, to spread the truth. We're going to use his own weapons against him. This is, this, is none of, this is not what God ever calls us to do. That is backwards. That is contradictory. It's hypocritical. If you're really serious about being separate from the, the paganness around you, the pagan nations around you, like the Israelites were called to be separate, it's not a matter of ceremonial separateness, ceremonial washings and cleanings and ceremonial foods and circumcision of the flesh. It's about being set apart in, in every way, in the deepest ways, and being a stranger and alien in this amongst the kingdoms of this world because our citizenship is from heaven. But yet, no, we're, we're still running after all these things. We've discovered flat earth and the greatest lie ever, but we're still wanting to appeal to Hollywood. Somebody was just showing me this the other day. It was, you know, showing clips of when Ken Ham, when they were trying to build the Ark at AIG. And he's talking about how the world has, has Disneyland and Disney World and we can have that too. They spent a hundred million dollars building a, a wood ark out in the middle of nowhere. And they got their animatronic Noah. I mean, do you think the the world is really impressed? 
hundred million dollars. Have they come close to competing with Disneyland in, in terms of just sheer entertainment? Is is that is this how we should even be trying to teach things like Genesis, right? They're they're a hundred million dollars into this, and they're you know who knows? I don't know where they are financially, but you know they're pretty darn vested. And so yeah, for them to question, for them to have to like make difficult decisions like should we throw out all our curriculum that has to do with space and the Copernican model? That would be a they would suffer a lot. I mean, if Rob Skiba is a single individual, you know, suffered such a blow, I think they're even going to consider it or or give serious consideration to the idea that, no, maybe there weren't dinosaurs on the Ark. At a, after all, maybe dinosaurs are actually a hoax, too. I, there's no way. No, we want to we just want to emulate all these types of ventures, all these types of business slash ministries. All these men. I mean, Kent Hovind, in 2015, when we were all getting excited about Flat Earth, it was all breaking open, and Kent Hovind just, just happened to get out of prison right at that time, and we're all going, if, if Kent Hovind gets, gets a hold of this, it's going to be amazing. And now it's like three years later, and for all intents and purposes, Kent Hovind has possibly gone so far to have shipwrecked his faith. He's not, deni he's not denying faith. But that's a sad state of affairs, no matter how they slice it. And people who were once championing his cause, myself included, the Ho Vindication campaign, I was all in that. You know, they've, se they've seen a whole nother side to him. You know, so much of it just boils down to he wouldn't let go of his, his baby. He wouldn't let go of his venture. He wouldn't let go of, just let go of the... the uh, some land in, in Florida wouldn't listen to correction from anyone, you know, just kept charging forward. And, and this man who was once a hero to so many of us, I mean, half of, half of the first scientific exposed almost is just clips of Ken Hovind. And now we, we see like to what lengths, you know, that stubbornness and hard heartedness, you know, and turning your quote unquote ministry into an idol in and of itself how destructive that can be. Are we really ready to face what is ahead of us? Have we really learned the lesson of this, this quote-unquote gift of looking stupid? I know thousands of people out there are on board with what I'm saying and, and agree with what I'm saying and say amen. But sometimes, uh, you know, and I, and I know that more now. I get less discouraged about it now because with these kinds of things, there is uh, way more of a silent majority than a lot of people would like to admit. It's easy to focus on, on the people that are always uh, in the forefront, that are always on stage and getting lots of attention, and constantly promoting themselves. But the, the real body of Christ, nobody even sees. The real stories, most people are not, do not hear. So, you know, what is, what is God calling us to do? To continue just digging ourselves in deeper and deeper? Trying to take what started out as a completely grassroots, organic <laughs> movement or happening or awakening or whatever and institutionalize it, harness it, legitimize it? Do we start trying to plant flat earth churches, have flat earth pastors? Flat Earth missionary organizations, Flat Earth publishing companies. I mean, you know, like I said, the time is rapidly approaching when none of these things will be viable if you were to adhere to the uncompromising Word of God. It will not be possible. It will not be legal. Even if it's not outlawed, per se, in the same way that it is in a communist country or, or a Muslim country or whatever. True faith can be outlawed just by being being declared psychologically un, un, unsound. You know, there's more than one way. There's more than one way to imprison people and silence people. Not all jails look like jails. Some look like psych wards. But again, I think for the for, for the majority of people, it won't even come down to that. It just comes down to not wanting to walk away from even simple things like 
social media. So what are we doing? So what really happens when the, the sky, quote-unquote, falls? It's not just a question of trying to prep for some sort of natural disaster or government takeover, martial law situation with the blue helmets and all that. From where I stand, the biggest spearhead of the, the encroaching one-world system is the one-world religion that is central to it all. Even more important than, than the, the, the economy, the technology, the, what the actual mark is, it's, it's what the mark represents. It's what the mark is all about, buying into the spiritual lie. And it's everywhere right now, creeping in. And if the so-called leaders of this Christian flat earth movement don't even have the resolve to draw lines around themselves and not affiliate themselves in public, in business, in documentaries, in conferences with people who have 100% embraced the one world mystery Babylon religion right now when the persecution has not even yet begun, then, then what does that say? Why do we keep coming up with, with new ways and new excuses for trying to build friendship with the world? Why do we always want to have our cake and eat it too? Why are we so good at taking the house of prayer and turning it into a den of thieves? Why do we continue to allow ourselves to be enamored with pretty shiny things and our toys and special effects and five minutes of fame? All these little carrots that Satan dangles in front of all the lost people, all the lost people in the world to keep them chasing all of his hollow promises, chasing the, the hollow American dream, chasing the hollow, the empty utopian promises of global citizenship. But I think we're going to... You're going you're gonna to chase the same carrots on the same sticks, but it's for the kingdom? This is all going away. And, you know, people talk about, well, you know, get yourself... You know, YouTube is just the start. So, you know, moving to some other video platform or your own website, I mean, that that will delay getting removed, but YouTube is just the start. And once they feel like YouTube is, is cleansed, then it's going to move to the internet as a whole. And right there, that's your, in order to, to really do that, you know, they're going to look at people like you, like me, and most of you, if we're still trying to talk about this stuff on the internet, like, like we're cockroaches that just keep scurrying under things. And if you want to get rid of the cockroaches, you, you got to clean the whole house, right? They're not just going to clean under the, you know, you can't just do under the fridge. Because they'll come back, right? So the only real answer for what they're talking about is is complete lockdown. Complete censorship. And ultimately what they want to censor is the gospel. Satan doesn't care if you know about the quote-unquote elites or the powers that be or whatever else. He doesn't care if you know that space is fake. Satan doesn't care if you believe in a creator. Satan doesn't care if you believe that you're special. In fact, he's perfectly happy to play off of that all day long. I played the video just a few weeks ago of Carl Teichrip talking about transformational festivals and, and oneness, the myth of oneness. And part of the reason for playing that is pointing out, I, I, you know, that came out in 2014. That was before Flat Earth was a thing, you know, before the big, before the Flat Earth Awakening in 2015, right? And he's talking about how people are gravitating away from scientific materialism, away from materialistic evolution from cold to dead modernism and turning back to the ancient mysteries, turning back to mysticism, turning back to pantheistic monism, the essence of paganism, the essence of everything that we oppose, right? is about God is in everything. They're doing that already. They're turning away from quote unquote scientism already. It's the age. Now we're, we're entering into the era of enchantment, the era of spirit science, the era of quantum mysticism already. And all of that stuff can just be funneled right into flat earth. And it is. Just do, just do a search any given day. See what you find. 
for flat earth nowadays you know at the beginning there was it was you would look into it and there was a lot more stuff that was just talking about the bible coming out on a, on any given day you know a hundred different bible verses for for the flat earth and all that and you know enough of those have been done it makes sense that we don't keep doing them but what is but yeah the new age stuff just keeps exploding it's just going to roll over everything like a tidal wave as if the quote unquote Christian ministry aspect tries to kind of play nice with all sides and you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. At the end of the day, we're all just helping, you know, we're all just trying to help promote flat earth and promote awareness and promote consciousness and convince yourself that God's using all these people to, to bring people to himself. God's using Eric DeBay. God's using, you know, all even all these new age flat earthers to bring people to Christ. And he is. <laughs> he is. But that's what God's doing. That's not any of us. So we dare not take credit for that. And we dare not, like, use it as an excuse to continue essentially being in, in business partnerships with the people who are denying the gospel and refusing to, to speak out against the occult lies that they are embracing that are sending people to hell. Because there are so many things being taught in conjunction with Flat Earth in the name of Flat Earth that are sending people to hell. And it, it, so it cuts both ways. So yes, God can use the Eric Dubays. God can use the New Agers to even bring people to himself. But the enemy can also use all of us who profess the name of Christ the second we compromise. Whenever he finds some corner, some stronghold, some area where we don't want to let go, we don't want to let go of the world, we don't want to let go of our little empire of dirt that we've built up, we don't want to let go of our little idol of a ministry or idol of a business or just idol of being a part of the modern the modern world, period. Just being able to buy or sell or have a job or own property. That's what the Bible says is coming, you guys. There's no use in patting ourselves on the back for being biblical literalists when it comes to the nature of the of the earth and the heavens and the firmament only to then turn around and, and reserve our creative license when it comes to the scriptures regarding everything it says about the end of days and the times that we are now living. It's the whole council of scripture. Pretty much what I'm saying.